works of Ramesses, they don't exist anymore. Okay, I am a tyrant. I am thinking so high of myself. My works will also be gone. Hello and welcome back to Nobel Pop. We have been doing poems by Shelley for some time now. And today in this video, we are going to take up Ozymandias a popular sonnet written by Shelley and published in 1818. Although this poem might appear to be quite simple and straightforward, but there are things in this poem which I wanted to discuss with you so that you don't miss them. So don't skip anything in this video because it's going to be a shorter video comparatively. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, Please do so, so that we stay connected and you get notified every time a new video comes up. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. In our previous discussions on Shelley, uh, we have seen that he had been a rebellious spirit. He was quite close to his fellow romantic poets like Byron. He led a very emotionally charged life, took some really drastic decisions and uh, often regretted them, but stood by his convictions, uh, mostly about atheism, mostly about the way he looked at the world. Above everything else, Shelley is a philosopher. He is a great lyric poet, of course he is, but his poetry is not without any cause behind it. So he's always fighting for a cause, he's always putting forth some argument which has a larger philosophical dimension. So he's not just writing for the sake of writing, he's writing for the sake of passing on a message. So our point today is to identify the message he wants to uh, pass on through Ozymandias. We will want to know why he wrote this and what are the various shades of meanings that might be hidden beneath the apparent, simple, straightforward message of the poem. Before starting with the text, uh, I would like you to first know about who Ozymandias was. Ozymandias uh, was the Greek name of the pharaoh, the Egyptian king, Ramesses II. Now, he was a powerful ruler and he was quite a megalomaniac because he felt that everybody should know about his exploits and he wanted to build a lot of monuments, uh, things by which people would remember him. Now Egyptians uh, were obsessed with uh, constructing great monuments. We know about the pyramids. Ramesses too, he wanted to be remembered for his greatness, his majesty and because of that he ordered to construct a great statue of him. Now, why was Shelley writing on it? That statue, which uh, turned into uh, quite a bit of a ruin through history, through time, that was recovered and put at a museum and it was on display. References to these statues were found in books written by people. And somehow this whole idea about uh, a mighty king's statue turning to this ruin, that might have attracted Shelley. But more than the statue, what uh, must have attracted him was the inscription that was beneath the statue. So once we read the poem, we would know what that inscription is and why it could have uh, had a great appeal for Shelley. So with this bit of background, let's just uh, start with the text. Ozymandias, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, so it begins as if Shelley is telling us that a traveler came to him. This traveler was traveling from an antique land, from an old land. Of course, here it might mean Egypt. And this traveler narrated to Shelley an incident or an observation which Shelley is recounting back to us. So this is like a, a double mode of narration. You can say he is being a, a reporter rather than an initiator of this story. So this is not a story which Shelley tells us. It's a story that the traveler has told Shelley and he 
relates it back to us. And what that story is? Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. So the story is about two huge stone legs, legs of a huge statue and it's trunkless. Trunkless means, trunk means the upper part of somebody's body, you know, above the waist. So that statue is an incomplete one because the top portion of that statue is missing, it's gone. Only the legs remain. Near them on the sand, it's a desert where this traveler saw this statue. Near the legs, he also saw what? Half sunk a shattered visage lies. Visage means face. So presumably this stone face belong to the same statue to which the legs belong. Okay, so the same statue, uh, it's like half destroyed and the head that toppled off into the sand and it's half sunk. So it's not even completely visible. And then he says, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell us that it sculptured well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. So what is visible on that face sunk in the sand? Frown. Frown means an expression where you don't give off a feeling of joy or happiness. It's like you are giving off a bitter expression. So that is frowning. So that face is a frown and you have wrinkled lip. So when somebody uh, purses the lip in a tight way, it gets more wrinkly. So this expression on this stone face is not a very welcoming one. It's not a very happy and jovial and friendly expression. It's as if, uh, you know, made to turn people away, scare them, intimidate them. And then we have this word and sneer of cold command. Command means what? When you order somebody something or you govern somebody. So a king is, of course, associated with command. But... The word command has a military ring to it. So the statue belonged to somebody who commanded armies, who had a lot of power. And at the same time, there was a coldness in it. So it was not a warm, generous, smiling king who also has a lot of command, of course. But this ruler or this commander has a coldness about him and a sneer. Sneer is a very unique expression uh, which a person shows when that person wants to show contempt for somebody, uh, showing that you are, you know, low people and I am great. So that kind of uh, smirky smile, uh, which is very difficult to master if you are a good and kind soul. Uh, but if you are a very proud person, arrogant person and uh, you think that this whole world doesn't have any idea of how great you are, then you give out oh, this expression which is a sneer. So on that face which was sunk in the desert sand, these three things were visible, frown, wrinkled lip and a kind of stern, sneering, commanding expression. And what does that tell about the artist, the sculptor who created that statue? It shows that the sculptor could reproduce the inner workings of that mighty commander on the face of that sculpture. Whenever a sculptor builds a statue, uh, then he or she usually keeps a model or imagine somebody's face in his mind. Here we can assume that uh, this king uh, wanted his statue to be built and he probably modeled in front of the sculptor who probably had a sketch made and then reproduced the expression which the sculptor saw on the face of the king. 
So, if you find that a statue uh, is having a lot of expression on the face, it shows that the sculptor is greatly accomplished. The sculptor is greatly successful to reproduce the different nuances of the face which he was studying in front of him. So, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell us that its sculptor well those passions read. Now, this construction is uh, basically a grammatical inversion. If you reconstruct this sentence, it would read that the frown, wrinkled lip, sneer of cold command tell us that its sculptor read those passions well. Now, it's getting clearer for you, right? So, the sculptor was accomplished, he was capable of producing those expressions on the face and these expressions which yet survive. So, they are still there visible on that face. The statue is broken but that expression remains and stamped on these lifeless things. What are the lifeless things? The stone on which uh, he carved the statue. That is the lifeless things. So, this is very unique because you are taking stone which is apparently a lifeless thing and then uh, the sculptor produces something so lifelike on it that it transforms into something living, animated, okay, although stone is lifeless. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. Now what does this statue tell? about the person whose statue it is. This statue shows that this king was a provider. He provided people with resources, of course. He fed his people and at the same time he mocked them. How did he mock them? He mocked them feeling that he is a great person and his people were beneath him. So, this you can say superiority complex which Ramesses II had, this Ozymandias had, is reflected on the statue's face and on the pedestal these words appear. Now, beneath this statue or rather those uh, ruined remnants of the statue, the legs, there was this uh, platform, this place where some inscriptions were there. And what uh, were those inscriptions? My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. The king wanted everybody to know that this was his statue. And not just that, he wanted to pass a message to posterity. What message? That see, I am the great Ozymandias, I was the king of kings, uh, you might be mighty kings now. So, he is rather addressing future kings of Egypt, future kings of the world and he is saying that you might have become mighty and powerful, but you look at what I have done and feel that you can never ever reach this greatness which I have reached. So, this is what a, a very megalomaniac, a very proud and arrogant king would do. So, he is doing that. This is the apparent meaning of these inscriptions. We will come to some other shades of meanings that these lines might mean. But knowing uh, that uh, Ozymandias was an arrogant person, we can assume that he really wanted to intimidate future kings, challenging them in a way and being very sure that no matter how great future kings might be, they would despair when they would look on my works because I have achieved something unachievable. And then three very interesting lines. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. So right after, that arrogant inscription, we have a statement which says that nothing remains. Whatever mighty works Ozymandias was referring to in his inscription, that look on my works, there is nothing left. What is left is, you can say, boundless desert sand. What remains is nature. What is gone was made by man. Now, this is the plain and simple first impression reading of this poem. 
Now we will try to find out if there is something we can identify here in this poem. We will look at the form, uh, we will look at the meter, we will look at the images uh, separately and we we'll try to find out uh, whether there could have been possibly some other meaning too hidden beneath the apparent one. So first let's just look at the form of this poem. This is a sonnet. A sonnet is a very conventional form. By the time Shelley was writing, sonnet was a very conventional form. Before the Romantics uh, started writing, we had this huge legacy of, you know, Petrarchan sonnets, Elizabethan sonnets, Shakespearean sonnets, metaphysical sonnets. So, it's nothing unique that Shelley is doing here. He is writing a sonnet, one of the most popular forms of English poems. So, what is unique about it? We call Shelley a rebellious poem. So why was a rebellious poet taking up uh, such a conventional format, such a conventional genre to express something? You see, the romantic poets, they added a new dimension to sonnets. Sonnets were conventionally on love, on religious themes. Here we find that Shelley is writing a sonnet not on love, of course, not on religion, but on a philosophical idea and at the same time he is using the conventional iambic pentameter uh, for this. There is a standardized rhyme scheme here although not that much of a standard here. If we look at the lines here uh, we will be able to identify the stanzaic structure or the rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme is A B A B A C D C and then we have E D E F E F. So there is a rhyme scheme, but not any standard rhyme scheme. Okay. Usually in sonnets, the octave and sestate is clearly separated, distinguishable. Even in Shakespeare, there is a thematic break uh, which you can see, at least in the concluding couplet. So there is a kind of a structure. But here we see that uh, one part of the sonnet flows into the other. And usually when we read sonnets, because sonnet is also, you can say, linked with song, with musicality, usually uh, we have a tendency of pausing at the end, which makes the rhyme more understandable, right? But here, if we read Ozymandias, you will see that the pause which you would like to give does not come at the end of the lines. So you don't pause on the rhyming words. So the rhyme is more like a visible thing than an auditory experience. Therefore, it's difficult to feel that this is a rhymed poem. One more thing is, after the inscription, we have three lines, which kind of give a conclusion to the poem. But these are not rhyming couplets. The rhyme here is F-E-F. So there is a break in rhyme. This is rebellion. Rebellion is not always, you know, going out with a flag and screaming at the top of your voice at institutions. Rebellion is changing, evolving. And institutions are not always made of mortar and stone. Institutions are also sometimes in the form of you know, poetic genres that are handed down to you. So Shelley's rebellion was visible uh, not just in the way he talked about established institutions like the church or the government. His rebellion was also against the established institutions like Shakespeare, established institutions like Petrarchan sonnet and Milton's epic. So this is a real rebellious spirit where he knows how to accommodate his rebellious spirit within his folds of creativity. So his rebellion is in harmony with his creativity. Uh, last time, uh, like we were talking about harmonious madness when we were reading Skylark. This is harmonious madness. Apparently, if you are reading it as a sonnet, you would say, this is mad, this is not a sonnet. But this madness is harmonious madness. He's creating something out of it. He is reinventing the very form. The next thing which I want you to think about is why was this topic chosen by Shelley? Now Shelley's friend Horace Smith, he uh, spent a Christmas 
of 1817-18 at Shelley's house. And this was a very common thing among friends. They used to uh, write poems as competitions. And these two, they decided to write uh, sonnets as competition. And they both chose the same topic. And this topic was chosen from a history book by a Greek historian, Diodorus Siculus. Now, Diodorus Siculus was a historian. And in his book on Egyptian history, Smith and Shelley, they found information about uh, this huge statue and this inscription beneath the statue and that inscription was, uh, let me read it to you, King of kings Ozymandias am I, if any want to know how great I am and where I lie, let him outdo me in my work. Very arrogant claim that if anybody wants to know how great I am, let them do what I have done. So this caught the attention of Shelley and Smith and both of them they wrote these sonnets. Shelley's sonnet was published in 1818 first and then again in 1819. Why did he choose the name Ozymandias and not Ramesses too? Because Ozymandias has an oriental ring to it, uh, an academic ring to it maybe. And Shelley being uh, basically uh, a, an academician because he was so well read, Ozymandias as a name had a more poetic appeal for him. Okay. Now if you look at the publication date and the composing date, uh, you would see that this was some time after uh, Coleridge's Kubla Khan was published, Shelley's own Alastair was published. So we can safely say that this was a period in Shelley's life when he was getting more and more interested in these oriental stories and mythologies. And this interest was, of course, part of the colonial expansion that uh, Great Britain was uh, encountering in those days. It was expanding to you know, India, Africa. So those lands, the Orient, they offered an element of mystery, mysticism. And this was very appealing for romantic poets. Because again, see, romantic poets, they had this fascination for uh, something which is not civilized. And although uh, Egyptian civilization was one of the greatest civilizations, but to people who were, you know, post-industrial London, Egypt, India, no matter how developed their civilizations had been in ancient times, they would always look at those nations with a kind of condescending look that you are basically native people. Now thematically, Ozymandias is what? It is a statement that uh, Ozymandias had a feeling that his works would survive for a long time and people would uh, look at him at, in awe and would uh, say that, okay, we can't be what he had been. This is what Ozymandias thought. But it is seen that his statue is broken, shattered, uh, and all that remains is, you know, desert sand. And therefore, human beings should not be arrogant and proud because their works, their achievements are nothing uh, when a time defeats them eventually. Now, this is also a very conventional theme. We have seen it in Shakespearean sonnet, you know, effect of time on love, effect of time, on uh, life in general. And we have also seen that this struggle to seize the moment and at the same time to realize that time is not your best friend, is going to spoil everything, everything is going to go away. This has been always there in English poetry, be it uh, to his coy mistress, be it in Shakespeare's sonnets, be it in Dunn's metaphysical poetry. We have seen this struggle about time in poets since time immemorial. So what is special about this? What I found different in Shelley, which, which was not there in the other poets, is that while in the other poets, like Shakespeare, like Marvel, time is shown as a powerful agent of destruction, riding on a horse, chasing you down, you know, banging you with these iron fists. Okay, it's destroying you in a very dramatic and powerful way. This is what we see usually represented. Time is a powerful king destroying all. 
here look at the expressions that are used just go to the last two lines uh, what what is it say boundless and bare the lone and level sands stretch far away the words he deliberately uses alliterative boundless and bare boundless means limitless but bare means it is not ornamented by anything which you associate with civilization it is empty and then he says lone and level sands level means something which does not have a high rise doesn't have an elevation it's of a low key height so although time is seen as a destructive agent here the words that are used to describe time or here in this case nature as an extension of time because time doesn't work on its own time works through nature and destroys man made things so time extended through nature is represented through words like bare lone lonely and level these are not very powerful aggressive words this is because shelley understood that aggression disturbance this is not natural decay is natural and decay is not disturbing decay is something which is expected and so he's saying round the decay of that colossal wreck this is again um, you can say an oxymoron colossal means huge usually we uh, use the word colossal with huge structures which are standing which are existing but here colossal is used as an adjective for wreck something which is ruined so is it colossal or is it completely gone man's achievements are turned into ruins by nature's actions because nature is more powerful but is it is this poem only about ozymandias his achievements versus nature and how nature uh, is permanent and ozymandias's works are uh, you know transient and gone in time is it about that is it not about this sculptor too this is what we miss this poem is not about the destruction of ozymandias's work only this is also about the destruction of the sculptor's work these are the two different things the sculptor is not arrogant so it's somehow telling you that ozymandias's work is totally gone like it's total desert now sculptor's work is still there a little bit of it still remains but it's also ruined so no matter what kind of a person you are arrogant non arrogant tyrant artist you are subject to the decay of time still still art has a greater potential to survive than arrogance say now this whole idea of a tyrant associated with art where else have you found this if you have read kubla khan you have kubla khan he ordered a dome to be built coleridge wrote a poem on it and very interestingly coleridge mentions the fact that the shadow of the dome of pleasure floated on the river which means that this dome is not guaranteed any permanence it's precarious it, it might just go away any day and there's another very interesting line in kubla khan i want to read to you that line amid this tumult kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war so it was creation that was going on around him people were building a dome but he was hearing ancestral voices voices of kings who were there before him telling him that all you will have in your life is destruction a tyrant's life a king's life a commander's life is not about achieving any kind of creative glory whatever glory a commander achieves is through destruction but ironically the commander wants to be remembered through the creation of a statue which is a work of art look at the specific phrases he uses here half sunk half sunk means 
Ozymandias, the king, is gone. The statue is destroyed. Only little bits and pieces remain. That too half sunk, which means that if that statue or the remnants of that statue uh, were not recovered and put in a museum, that would be totally destroyed in time. When a statue gets destroyed in desert, what is actually happening here? Stone, a statue is made of stone and eventually it returns to its original element that is sand and stone. And it's almost a biblical, you know, uh, from dust are we made and to dust we return. The statue is made of stone which is made from dust becomes dust. So we can say that the statue is um, kind of an extension of the human life in a way but that is also not allowed any kind of permanence because human life is not allowed any permanence, any immortality. Now think about the expression on that face. When Ozymandias ordered uh, the sculptor to build him a statue and he modeled for him, he looked at the sculptor and the sculptor could see that expression of you know contemptuous bitter frown and the feeling that i am great ozymandias you are a petty sculptor so this whole thing is a representation of a you know dynamics between the model and the artist and ozymandias had no problem giving off that kind of a look because he wanted to be remembered that way it speaks volumes about our characters if we see the photographs which we want to display. We take a lot of photographs like right? selfies and photos but we don't display all of them publicly. We display those photos publicly where we express something through our eyes, through our smile or through our grim expression which we want the world to see. So Ozymandias wanted the world to see him as an arrogant king because he felt that this was permanent. His achievements were permanent and everybody uh, should be informed about how great he is because somehow it is also seen that achievements often go hand in hand with arrogance. Often the highly accomplished people are the ones who are very arrogant and proud people. There are, of course, people who are humble and at the same time very accomplished. But we often hear about highly accomplished artists who are eccentric, okay, who do not know uh, how to not be rude to people. So often arrogance goes hand in hand with greatness. So this is not unusual for a king to have a stern expression on his face. And when you place the quality of the sand that surrounds, the level sands, the lone sands, you would understand the contrast. Now I want you to look at the inscription again. I am Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, you mighty and despair. What if it means completely opposite of what we are thinking it means? Can it not also possibly mean that you people, you mighty kings, look at my works, it does not exist anymore and despair because your works will be destroyed like my works are destroyed. Maybe, maybe not. This is what Shelley does to you. He will make you question your own understanding. While we were thinking that Ozymandias was an arrogant king who felt that his work was permanent and everybody should be afraid of him, scared of him, intimidated by him and think that, okay, that was the great Rameses and we can never be like him. Maybe this is not the whole story because these lines taken out of context would mean something else altogether that Ozymandias was a philosophical guy who knew that his works will not be permanent. And he also felt that this statue might still remain 
even when his works were gone. Because then only people would be able to read that message and think that works of Ramesses, they don't exist anymore. Okay, I am a tyrant. I am thinking so high of myself. My works will also be gone. Maybe this is another meaning you can think about. But of course, if somebody asks you, uh, what do those inscriptions mean? You should tell them the first thing which we discussed, the first meaning which we talked about. And then you can hang in this question that these two lines might also mean something completely different and philosophical. Maybe Ozymandias didn't think it that way, of course, because his inscriptions were not exactly these words. He had said that you have to be what I am to understand how I am, all these things. This is Shelley talking to you. So Shelley's poem is about what the traveler is saying, what Ozymandias is saying and what Shelley is saying. And they all get mixed up. These narrations, these statements all depend on each other's perspectives, filtered through each other's perspectives. So we can reach Ozymandias through the eyes of Shelley, looking through the eyes of the traveller. But since the source of this poem is a book, not a statue which Shelley saw, so this whole thing is basically imagination. And we know that imagination is greater than reality or better than reality in a romantic perspective or the romantic philosophy. If you want to identify the figures of speech here, you will be able to find some of the synagdokis that he is using, where he is using the expression hands and heart, that is part for the whole. Uh, you have Hyperbole, king of kings, of course he was not the greatest king. There had been great kings before him, there had been great kings after him. There are so many alterations we find. And this is also strange because in Old English, rhyme was not a popular thing. Alteration was. And then there was a revival of alteration later too in Middle Ages. Alterative revival. Shelley was using a sonnet form. Sonnet uh, must have a rhyme scheme. So he was, yes, using a rhyme scheme. But the auditory effect, the sound effect, comes more from alliteration than from rhyme. So he is uh, working his way around the sonnet, trying to inject into it some native English spirit maybe, the native English spirit that was first founded on alliteration when his earliest forefathers were writing or speaking you know, in Old English poetic lines. So this poem is about the way in which nature, about the way in which time is presented as the greatest conqueror and somehow in front of nature working uh, hand in hand with time, human achievements, even art is of no significance. I hope this class has been useful to you. Now that we have completed O to the West Wind, to a Skylark and now Zimandius, we can safely assume that we have some basic fundamental ideas about uh, Shelley's philosophy. So once we take up texts like Defense of Poetry, eventually in the future, we will have less difficulty to understand uh, different notions, different ideas of poetic creativity that Shelley puts forward in that book. Thank you for staying with us and we will meet you again soon in a fresh new video. Till then, stay subscribed, stay happy. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off.